Hi, everyone. Welcome to Compelling Conversation. I'm Dush Ramachandran, and my guest today is Nina Sassaman Pogue, who is the author of the new book, This Is Not the End, Strategies to Get You Through the Worst Chapters of Your Life. Welcome, Nina. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an absolute delight. Um, now, this is a very timely book, uh, especially when, you know, with the pandemic going crazy as it is, and everybody's locked down, worried about what this, what's going to happen, their finances, their lives, their health, and so on. Um, you offer really some tremendous hope in this, in this time. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you came to write the book. Well, I've had a very storied life, so I've done a lot of different things. I was a gymnast, uh, I was on the US team, and then I was a college gymnast, and I was a news anchor, and I worked in tech, so I've done a lot of things. Uh, but in between those highs, uh, I had a lot of lows, and uh, I was on the US team, but I didn't make the Olympics. And I was a top NCAA recruit, but I blew out my knee in college. Uh, and then I also uh, went on to be a, an Emmy-winning news anchor, but then I did get let go at the top of my game in budget cuts one year. So I've had these different things in my life that, that have happened. And I also uh, got out of television after a, a traumatic accident. Uh, and then I got into tech and had some great success there. So I became this person that people were, would come to and go, how did you do that? You know, how did, how did you make that happen? Uh, and I found myself um, constantly in that setting where I was talking to somebody about, you know, something they were going through and helping them get through it. And whether it was somebody knocking on my door with a cup of coffee, like a grown man <laughs> with a cup of coffee saying, hey, just lost my job, you know, me, you know, my wife, my kids, like, can you help me think this through? Or whether it was someone you know, booking a 30 minute sink on my my calendar at work, I became this go-to person. Um, and after a while, I decided it would be a better and wonderful, and I could catch more people and help more people if I could figure out how to organize those thoughts and put them into a book somehow. Because I knew I had some answers, but I wasn't sure exactly what that answer was. You know, that's so fascinating. You talk about all of these different instances where you've had your ups and your lows, and you've reached amazing highs. Um, and then you've had some really uh, devastating lows. Right. So uh, tell us about some of the lows, just to set the context for your book and for what we're talking about today. Well, I mentioned some, so not making the Olympic team, blowing out my knee in college, being let go, also been through a divorce. I've had other times in my career where I've had setbacks. But the one that I talk about in the book for the first time in 15 years was an accident that I was involved in when I was the news anchor. Uh, and I went to pick up my son from the school bus and my dear friend, it was a crowded school bus, like you could imagine, kids going everywhere. And it was at my dear friend's house. Um, and in the midst of all of that, their baby crawled onto the driveway and I backed up. So I went from becoming this woman who was you know, a beloved news anchor and this world-class athlete to this person who had done this thing. It was very difficult, very dark time for me. I did end up going back on the air and we, we had a, a great you know, health out of that. It's been 15 years. He's a healthy high school boy now and he's good looking and he's a basketball team. So the story has a happy ending, um, which makes it easier for me to tell obviously but it's still a difficult story to tell. And, and that is part of this talk that I do about resilience and why it's so important because there was a really dark time there where I just didn't want to go on. I didn't want that to be part of my story. Like who, who wants that? How do you do that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So here's, here's the, the thing that's, that I'm sure intrigues everyone who speaks to you. Now that is an event that, is a sort of an occasion that absolutely drives most people into the ground, never to recover again. They become recluses, they you know, escape numbing themselves with drugs and alcohol, and um, you know, all kinds of self-destructive behavior. How did you come out of that experience and be the vital, leading, inspiring person that you are today? Well, you don't do that alone. I had good people around me. I had a lot of help. 
Uh, and I also, I was a very um, public figure. I was a news anchor at the time. So I had the support of my community. Um, I also had a, a great husband who helped me through it. Who knew I needed a guy with a psych degree? It was not what I married him for, but it came in handy. And I, I did have those people around me, but I also worked through and I, I found a good therapist, those types of things. Um, fortunate for me, the family that I went through it with, we went through it together. We were very close through the whole thing. Um, but I did work through different stages of grief and um, went through a very scary time where I had, you know, suicidal thoughts and, and I put them in the book for the first time. People who've known me in the years since, in the 10 years since go, wow, that was really dark um, because I don't have that attitude in life in general, but it was a dark time. Um, and I talk in the book about, it's why it's called strategies to get you through the worst chapters of your life. Um, I talk in the book about all the things that I did, but it took me until years later to look back to realize all the things that I did. I didn't sit down with a book to tell me how to do it. I, I went to the store looking for answers. I like, got books on PTSD, I got books on religion and faith. You know, people are like, oh, God has a plan. I'm like, well, if that's your God's plan for a baby to end up under the tire of my car, like, I want nothing to do with your God. I went through a very difficult time. Sure. And then I thought maybe I was like, Buddhist or Lakota Indian. I went on this search for you know, where I could fit in, like earth, wind. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a journey. It was a lot of reading um, and a lot of conversations. And that's what's in the book. Um, it's the book that I was looking for when I first went there. I, the original name of it was Get Past This. That's what I wanted to call it. Just, I just wanted someone to, I wanted to look at this bookshelf and, and see something that said, here you go, grab this and you'll get past this without you know, jumping off a bridge. Sure. And you know, I think that's really the most critical thing because uh, in your book, you provide exactly the, the recipe or the, uh, the cookbook approach to what people need and everybody is facing a situation much like uh, that. I mean, perhaps it's not the same thing, but in different aspects of their life, you know, they're losing their jobs or they're losing their homes or that they don't have cash. Uh, they're wondering what they're going to do about childcare, what they're going to do about feeding their children. There's a lot of worry and anxiety in the world. And your message that this is not the end is, is so appropriate and so timely um, that, you know, I, I felt compelled to really have a deep chat about this. So what is the prescription? So how do people get beyond this? And I think you cover this beautifully in the book. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, let's, let's talk about that. Um, what, what can we do? What can one do when faced with a situation like this to realize, to know deep within themselves that this is not the end? And that's one of the reasons that I put the book together the way I did is because I, I had this you know, thoughts on, I learned about cognitive behavioral therapy and a little bit of Zen and a little bit of stoicism and a whole lot of different things all put in there together. Um, and I don't use any of those words in this book. I use very commonly, you're never gonna hear me say any of that. I, I wrote it as a mentor. I don't have a master's degree in you know, stoic philosophy or something, um, but I, I wrote it as a mentor with my life experience combined with all of the learnings that I've done. And I put a lot of other people's information in there as well. Sure. But one of the things I start with is kind of meeting you up where you are. I mean, the book begins with, this is a really crappy way to meet you. And then I kind of walk through, it's about you, not me. And I just walk through kind of the crazy stuff that's going on in your head right now when something big happens and then how to fit it into your head, how to look at yourself as the main character in the story of your life, what the story of your life may unfold to look like, try to put, uh, do some perspective work and then some language work. And so it, it unfolds. And I talk about the really dangerous thoughts you're having um, later in the book um, and it's chapter eight. So I, I try to lay that out for folks. So. They have a roadmap of, of specific things. And I, I sometimes say, if you pick up the book, it actually in chapter three, before I lay out all the strategies, I say, okay, so if you're just having crazy thoughts and you're really scared, just jump to chapter eight and just read that. Let me help you. Or if you are afraid to go out in public, like you don't know what to say, just jump to chapter nine. I'll teach you how to make a script to protect yourself right. in public. 
it's 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 bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that you you speak about in the book is, I think, one of the key messages is resilience. Um, how you develop resilience to get through things like this, and you've you've had disappointment, and having trained uh, to be in the Olympics, not being able to make the Olympics because you blew out your knee. Uh, for a young person, that's got to have been absolutely crushing. And you would probably, I'm sure, would have felt at that time like the rest of your life didn't have any meaning because that's what you prepared yourself for all of the preceding years. And now to find that that's no longer a, real, a realizable dream is absolutely devastating. So you speak about resilience. So tell us a little bit about how does one develop that resilience? Well, it's interesting. One of my chapter six is my favorite chapter in the book, and that's where this concept of resilience, where this perspective comes from. Um, we do this in two parts. I want to talk about this current situation we're in and, and where we are with that. But first, let me talk about this timeline that we're having. So, in the chapter six, I do the, I get a little nerdy and I do a little math with you to kind of put in perspective where things fit in. So, when I lost my sport when I was 19, and I do want to um, clarify, I blew out my knee in college. And before that, for the U.S. team, I just didn't make the top six. Okay. Um, there were just people better than me. <laughs> but in college is when I blew out my knee. Um, so I went from being on the U.S. team, which is a larger group, to not making that top six. Just wanted to clarify there. So I um, talk about when I lost my sport at 19, all right, that was, if you do the math, uh, about 85% of what I'd known in my life. So I'd been in the gym since I was about five. And so my whole life had been in the gym, training and traveling. It had been gymnastics. And so when I lost the sport, it just did feel like my whole life was gone because that's what I knew. Sure. But if you play it forward, when I was 50, turned 50 and my kids went away to college, uh, by that point, that gymnastics piece was about 28% and parenting was about 40% of my life. So as you go, the math works with you. The easiest way to think about it for everybody individually who's listening is, remember how long the summers were when you were 10 years old? Like it just felt like these days went on forever. It was just a magical time to be 10. Um, when you're 10, that year of your life is one tenth of everything that you know. Right. One tenth of your whole life experience. When you're 40, that year is 140th of your whole life experience. Same 365 days, but it's one tenth in one situation and one fortieth in the other. So the older you get, the math adjusts by how um, acute these uh, sensations are, or the, the things that you're going through feel. And so I always say, if you're a 40 year old parenting a 10 year old and they say, you just ruined my life by doing something, they really do kind of feel like that, <laughs> you know? But when you're 40, I mean, that year goes by in a snap when you're parenting and working and doing all of that. So it's just that, that concept. So I do the math and I lay it out. And my favorite thing about resilience um, is the way a book can lay out. So right now, you and I are, are having a shared moment right now. So in, in your book, the book of your life, what colors the cover, you know, you open it up to today and I would open up my book to today. And right now, both of us are in each other's books. That's kind of cool. We're having this crossover moment, um, which is a neat thing. But everything that we are led us up to this point in our books. And then that's who we are. And now we're having a, a, a today, which is an open page, but all the pages ahead are blank. And that thought that all the pages ahead are blank is really, really key. And I think that that is what we all collectively um, will get to with this pandemic. I think it's really a fascinating moment that for the first time, um, you know, like 9-11, everybody says, where were you in 9-11? When you have get together for a beer, everybody has that conversation. And like everybody has a story. But now this will be, where were you in the pandemic of 2020? But across the globe, everyone will have a story. This is a shared global experience, which is really a fascinating thought. And if we look at it in the books of our lives, it is a moment. Everyone's going to have everyone's going to have this chapter in their lives, and then those pages ahead are blank. So what you're doing right now is creating that future for yourself. Um, but what's really key is this is just a chapter. It is not your whole book. It feels like it when we're in the middle of it, and, and when 
anytime you're in the middle of a, of a divorce or a trauma or something after a car accident, just feel like the whole world is crumbling. But it's just a piece, it's a few pages, maybe a chapter. It's not your whole book. If you timeline it out and you think about it, lots of blank pages ahead and, and we will get to five years from now and have that conversation with a friend over a beer and go, where were you in the pandemic of 2020? That we're gonna have stories, sad, interesting, different. Everyone's gonna have their own version, um, but we are all gonna have a story to tell. I think, you know, one of the most powerful images that, that you create is the notion of the book, where you open the book to today's page and we're in each other's book. But the most powerful image is the rest of the book is empty and it's yours to write. And you have the option to write it any way you want. You can write it as a dystopian, you know, pessimistic uh, view of how it's gonna unfold, or you can look to the bright side and you know, seek to make a difference in how the rest of your life unfolds. And that's an incredibly powerful and empowering message. Um, that's fabulous, I love that. In, in the moment we're in right now, it's really empowering because when something big happens in your individual life and you make some big changes, people are like, oh, well, they just went through that, so they made some big changes. People don't even ask questions. It's kind of like you get a pass to just do something crazy different when something big happen, happens in your life. So here we all are having this moment and people may come out of this and go, you know, I don't think I want to do that job anymore. I think I really love my job a lot more than I did. Or I think I'm going to, you know, I think like get divorced or not get divorced. I think there's going to be big things that happen out of this and no one is going to question them. Now on a smaller scale for all of us, this is an opportunity to go, who am I? Do some, you know, some self-reflection and go, what do I really want to be five years from now? Like if I if I have this opportunity where no one's gonna question that I like did some soul searching and made a big change, what do I really want to be? Um, part of this I call being the CEO of yourself. Right. And when I speak, I speak on resilience a lot, and that's look at all your resources, look at what you know, set the vision, look at your resources, and sometimes like like a CEO would, and set that vision. Sometimes you have to make adjustments. Like are there people in your life correct? Is the setting in your life correct? Is the language that you're using correct? Are you stuck at home or are you staying at home? How are you thinking about things? And then it comes out of your mouth and then it comes back to you. And then that's your story. And your back subconscious, to- here's the language you're using. And that's mm-hmm. the program it's acting on. And that is so incredibly powerful because when we speak to ourselves, the way in which we speak to ourselves reflects the way in which we approach our lives. And I think you make a really powerful point about the language that you use to describe your situation. You're either stuck at home or you're choosing to stay home and attend to other parts of your life. Uh, you know, just as a, um, sorry, you were going to say. You're safe at home. Stuck at home or safe at home? Yeah. They're very big difference. Very big difference. And, you know, there's some very good things that have come out of this. Uh, for a lot of people, certainly speaking for myself, um, you know, I've connected with family uh, in a way that I had never done before because we were all running around, you know, busy. Everybody's got jobs and work to do and businesses and so on. And we've been having Zoom cocktail parties with, uh, with family. Uh, just a couple of weekends ago, um, we had a Zoom cocktail party with my nieces who live in Toronto, and my son who lives in Japan. And it was, you know, it was five o'clock our time, it was seven o'clock in Toronto and eight o'clock in the morning in Japan. We all got together and it was brunch for my son. And so he poured himself a a Bloody Mary and we all had drinks and it was fabulous. And the plan was to have, uh, you know, started around five o'clock our time and go for, you know, an hour or so. We ended up talking for five hours. Oh my gosh. We were, we were on this Zoom call for five hours. And it just shows, I mean, it's not like anybody forced anyone to stay on. The conversation just went on and on. And the fact of being able to see one another and share reminiscences or memories of times past uh, when my nieces and my son were growing up, um, they all grew up around the same time and in the same town. And they're all now you know, scattered to the four winds, but the opportunity to bring all of them together and for us to chat with them, 
is absolutely amazing. And that is one extraordinarily powerful good thing that's come out of this. We've had other Zoom cocktail parties with other family members, my wife's aunt and uncle, and uh, you know other people, her, her mother and her aunt. It's been absolutely fabulous. And you would never have thought, and you'd think, why didn't we ever do that before? Because people were busy. And you would say, well, maybe we should call them, but then they're out doing this or that or the other thing. Now everybody's home and this is a perfect time. So, you know, that, that speaks to your point of framing this within your own mind as to what this opportunity is. This is an opportunity to look at your life and see what changes you want to make. And we may never go back to some of our old ways. Well, and the key to that story in itself, the beauty in that is that everyone had time to, you went five hours, when else, when everybody's busy, would anyone sit still for five hours exactly. and have a conversation? Exactly. I got to get up and go to work in the morning. I'm flying. I'm catching a flight. I mean, everybody's busy, but nobody's doing any of that right now. I've had some of the longest conversations I've had in years with old friends and just checking on people because everybody has time to talk. Yep. And we have gotten to a point where we didn't have time to talk anymore, which is really uh, fascinating. Uh, we keep using the word resilience. And I, I did want to share this thought that I've been thinking about a lot during this is the people who are all like, grit and persistence, those part, like, let's go, let's go, let's go people. And there's some of the rock stars in our companies and our, in our worlds and our lives too. They're probably having the hardest time right now because sure. you can't just power through and keep doing what you're doing. Um, resilience, the word resilience, so why you're hearing that so much in the news in different places and not grit or persistence, is the whole idea of resilience is to adapt and change. Sure. Um, that is the definition of resilience, to adapt and change and to um, go through an adversity and adapt in a positive way. So that in a positive way piece, that optimism, that, that's a big key to it. So we can look at, like you said, some of the stuff that has come out of this that we want to keep. I, I would love to keep the the imperfect action everybody's taking. People are yeah. just like, just doing stuff and it may work, it may, it may not. I love all the comedians that are doing stuff from home that's just- Yeah, working. exactly. I kind of like it. I love it. Yeah, that's completely natural. And it's, it's somewhat less produced. Uh, people mm -hmm. are just hanging out, having a good time. Um, and I don't know if you've seen um, um, the, the, the Good News uh, Network or GSN, uh, some good mm -hmm. news, SGN. Uh, SGN. Yeah, which is so great. It's just, you know, people sharing good news with, uh, um, what's, what's, what's the actor's name? I'm blank. I, I knew you were gonna say that, but it's Adam, I can picture his face perfectly. Yes, but I'm he's on it. Jack Ryan. I'm, 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 Jack Ryan, we'll just call him Jack. <laughs> okay, there you go. But this is it, you know, unscripted, totally fun, relaxed, but people are having a good time, you know, and you just have to find a way and coming back to uh, your book. Um, I think a very important part of recognizing that this is not the end is finding some way to be happy, some way to inject some levity and some, some, some good feelings into what we're going through right now. It's very true. And I, I two ways, in our current situation, I would say, um, all of us have a moment to pause right now and look for the things that do make us happy. Sometimes we get really busy and we just go, I don't even, I'm just working and taking care of kids and running around. I don't even remember what makes me happy anymore. Um, but now we have a chance to kind of think of those and add some of that into our future. In the book, during a trauma, I talk about um, all the stuff that's going on in your head. It's really hard to think of anything good because you feel like you can't. Right. Like it's all got to be bad. Um, but you want, do need to think of some good things because it, and smile every once in a while and have that release because it has those neuropeptides and all that endorphins and dopamine. I mean, literally smiling does that in your body. So it reduces that stress and it's good for you, Absolutely. even in the toughest times. And so I talk about that in our current situation. Um, we all need to smile a little bit, step away from the TV every once in a while and, Absolutely. and let our bodies and our brains heal just like a trauma patient would you need to step away and let your body and your brain heal because it's looping all the bad stuff in your head um and that's just the way we are wired you know but the reality is 
we're not a zebra being traced, chased across a, a field by a lion. We're yes. not actually in that right now. We just feel like it. Yeah. But if you stop and go, oh, right now at this moment, I have food in the fridge. I'm physically okay. I'm talking to a friend. Like, yeah, I'm okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. John Krasinski. There you go. You got it. You win. <laughs> it's going to bug me. I started to stop and Google it, but I thought that'd be rude. <laughs> <laughs> you could have done it. But anyway, we've got it. Um, so coming back to your book. Um, so the book, This Is Not the End, is now available wherever books are sold? It is. It's available. At, um, it wasn't supposed to come out until August, okay. but we pushed the release date because of the situation we're in. Nice. And I've had some really wonderful feedback from folks who read it and said, this just helped me so much. Like, I, I didn't even realize, like, how much this was going to help me, which was really rewarding and just warmed my heart. Um, so we made, we put it out uh, on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, anywhere you want to get it. Um, it's available, Books A Million, Indigo, wherever you shop. But, um, and, and I'm, I'm super thankful to Morgan James Publishing, who helped me do that and moved everything up for me. They're great. Uh, and then I put it out on the ebook, the e-reader on your Nook or your Kindle or your Apple reader. We just put it out there for 99 cents. Oh, like, wow. Just, okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make it available for anybody who wants to pick it up. So we're going to leave that through the end of next month, just for 99 cents. So everybody who needs that support right now or just wants to look at ways in which you know, find a strategy that may help them, they have access to it right now for 99 cents. Fantastic. And so the book again is, This Is Not the End, Strategies to Get You Through the Worst Chapters of Your Life. So you can pick it up on Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon.com, Books A Million, uh, or the Kindle or Nook version, the ebook version is available for 99 cents. Is that right, Nina? That's right. And I, I just want to, you know, encourage people to, you don't have to read the whole thing. 99 cents, just open it and find something that may help you a little bit. You, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of getting books and I don't always read them all, but I usually find nuggets in there that can help me. So I think there's some nuggets that are very useful during this current situation we're all in. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation, please click like and subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you get notified every time we do a new video. Nina, thank you so much for your time. It was a delight chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been lovely. You stay safe. Thank you, and you too. Take care.